Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a guest today with an extensive resume in the chess world. Uh, She is a woman international master. She has been the Chilean national woman's champion many times. Uh, She was the first female vice president of FIDE, the first woman president of the U.S. Chess Federation. She is the head of the FIDE Social Action Commission. And most recently, she was named the director of the chess program at the Dalton School. So congratulations and welcome to WIM Beatriz Medanello. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for inviting me. So busy, busy. And and, and not the head of the Social Action Commission. You are not. Oh, okay. Um, they made me uh, they made me honorary president, but I'm not involved in FIDE actively anymore. I retired from that. Okay, well, we might as well start with that. I mean, so <laughs> I know that we were just talking before we recorded about um, how busy you are with your new role at Dalton. Of course, you've been at Dalton for years, but now you, with uh, the dearly departed uh, great director David McAnulty preceding you, you're you're taking over for him, uh, and that's keeping you quite busy. So, was that part of the reason for you to? Um, sort of uh, step aside as the director of the Social Action Commission? Yeah, obviously that was one of the reasons. And um, I have been working with David McAnulty since for a long time. We know each other since 2000 and actually 1993. And um, and we started working together in Dalton since 2006. So um, it's, it has been a pleasure and I'm delighted that I'm um, that I have the opportunity to um, to be the director of the Dalton Chess Program and also a teacher at Dalton School. It's a wonderful place to teach. Um, yeah. Big a chess tradition, so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. Yeah, rich chess tradition, of course, most famously, I am Josh Waitskin, a uh, legend of U.S. chess, went there. Uh, former perpetual chess guest, I am Casa Corley, also went to Dalton, and there's just so many master level, expert level players. Uh, shout out to Sheru Robinson, who also was a Dalton alumni. Um, and I should. Um, Grandmaster Delugi. Grandmaster um, Delugi. And two international, three international masters now. And the youngest one who already got the fee, the title and won the Pan American under 14 is Gus Houston. He will be an international master. He will be even a grandmaster. Yeah, I'm sure. So that- we have very, we have a tradition of very good players here. Yeah. And I'm just thinking out loud, I just want to quickly clarify that when I say dearly departed, I do not mean that David McAnulty has passed away. So I apologize about that. And I wanted to clarify that I am Jack (laughs) Peters, who John Donaldson and I discussed last week, also not passed away. So if we use the past tense about someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have passed. These people are alive and well and treasured. So just just wanted to clarify that. um, And David is having a blast. Yes. He's enjoying himself. He's now in Italy, oh, know, wow. vacationing. He's writing, I mean, he's reading and writing books and, and he's enjoying himself. Yeah, and I'm okay. very happy that he has this opportunity to, to you know, to, to enjoy his life. Yeah, so well-deserved retirement. So Exactly, very yeah. well-deserved. And he seems like the kind of person who, I mean, traveling is one thing, but he doesn't seem like he's just going to be idling, <laughs> whatever it is he does. <laughs> Similar to, again, John Donaldson, who had retired from the Mechanics Institute, but is uh, busy as ever. So speaking of busy as ever, you mentioned uh, you for, for your role at Dalton, you're getting there at 7.15. What, is, uh, what does the day look like for you as the Dalton director, uh, uh, the director of the chess program? Well, I have a, I have a weekly schedule from, um, yeah, we have early morning chess that begins at 7.30 in the morning. So I have to be here a little bit earlier than that, 7.15, 7.20. Then we have after school classes five days a week. We have Saturday morning program for K2, tournaments in the weekends. Obviously, I'm not doing everything by myself, but a lot of it myself. So, and David did it too. I mean, it's, but you know, it's such an exciting place to be because the school is fantastic. Their vision, um, progressive education, you know, how they, 
they implement a curriculum that embraces everyone. And I admire that deeply. You know, it's a, it's a great place to be. And um, it's a place where you can see that, you know, people, the children are being nurtured and they're being taught to become good human beings. And there's more diversity here now. Um, but, you know, equity is, equity is a big thing, you know, they try to provide e equal opportunities. It's a, it's, it's a great place. And it's great for chess and it's great, you know, good human elements. You know, these are the leaders of the world. Many of these kids may become uh, maybe the leaders of the world in the future. You know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have a chance to, to be part of their life, even if it's just a small you know, in a small degree, it's, it's fantastic. But I have been teaching for a long time, you know, for almost 30 years. So teaching is a big part of my life. Although people don't think, um, they don't recognize me as a chess teacher as much as my work as an organizer, a leader, or, you know, promoter. So I have been doing everything that has to do with chess, I think I have done. You, obviously <laughs> you really have i mean uh, we've had a, a lot of people with extensive re resumes and obviously great accomplishments but in terms of uh the number of roles that you've had uh i think um your your resume is as broad as anyone's um and of course i just want to say that from my perspective i appreciate that dalton supports chess so much i mean the um obviously it's um um oh elite institution in in new york and well respected but still to to commit the kind of resources it takes to have as many um chess teachers as they do and provide as much instruction five days a week for an after school program is basically unheard of um and i'm sure that's uh part of the secret sauce of how the program has had so much success but i mean just as as a chess uh fan i re i really appreciate all of the um support that they provide and have provided for so many years um, but Beatrice, if you're up for it, I wouldn't mind if we go back a little bit because, um, I mean, go, go really go all the way back because you, okay. you, you were born in Chile. The only other guest I've had, uh, from Chile is, uh, the Grandmaster Mauricio, F Mauricio Flores Ruiz, uh, esteemed author. And, um, he, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about chess in Chile, but, but he's, uh, younger than both of us. And so I was just curious what, what chess was like in your childhood and what, what brought you to the United States? Well, I learned how to play chess fairly late. I was 13 years old um, with a neighbor, with a friend. I was uh, the type of girl, I was very shy, very smart. Uh, I love science fiction and, <laughs> and science and so when I learned chess, I was fascinated by the game. And very soon I started going to the chess club in Santiago, it's called Club de Ajedrez Chile. And I started playing a lot in the summer initially, and then I really got into it. And then I discovered that very quickly I, I was able to improve, like from 13 to 16. At 16, I was already, you know, representing Chile in a South American championship. And there were other women players, older, obviously, and one about my age. But um, I was extremely talented because I didn't have anybody to teach me. And I just, be, it became, chess is like part of my DNA. It became very natural for me to play. Um, I remember when I started going to the chess club, they were all men smoking mm -hmm. cigars and pipes. And... I rem it was very scary. I wanted to leave. But thankfully, there was another girl, and I played again with her in the back office. And then I came back, and I started playing in tournaments. And there was a lady who used to make tea and sandwich, you know, and I loved that lady. I thought that was so nice. And so Chile, I have very warm memories about my time playing chess in Chile. And, um, you know, basically, I played... And then I came fairly young to the U.S., you know, my mid-20s. And earlier, I traveled in Europe extensively. I took, uh, I used to go to Europe for like three months at a time because South America is so far from everything. And back then, it was even more, you know, now people travel, you know, in the 1980s, it was not something that people would go to Europe and go for a week or a weekend and come back. So, um 
Yeah, so I started playing chess, getting to know the world. I grew up in a dictatorship, you know, the Pinochet dictatorship. And so for me, it was interesting to see how people outside of Chile was looking at the country and uh, the politics. So it was a very enriching experience to be part of the chess community and to be become a citizen of the world in a way, and a very early, at a very early age. Um, and then I wanted to stay in chess, but um, but it was a hard thing to do in Chile. So I started traveling, and at some point I came to play in the New York Open in New York, and I met somebody. Um, we got married in Las Vegas at the National Open. And and then I didn't go back to Chile for three years. You know, I came for three months. I used to plan my trips that way, you know, to play a lot of chess and then come back. And I stayed here for three years, and then I went back to see my family. And, um, and I wanted to, and at that point I needed to decide also, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. And um, and I have some opportunities, like in New York City, they were recruiting people to um, to work in Wall Street. I have a degree in accounting, and so and another one in education. So basically, um, at that point, I was offered that opportunity, but I didn't want to do it. I wanted to make chess work. I wanted to be around chess all my life. Um, so I did, and in the beginning. Uh, I was very lucky that my first job was at Dalton School, but not working at the school as an assistant coach for Tosar Jovanovic, who was the first chess coach in Dalton. So I had the pleasure to work with Tosa Jovanovic, David McAnulty, and now myself. So the three directors of the programs, I have been close, very close to them. Um, so this was a natural progress, uh, progression. Um, so I started at Dalton, assisting him in tournaments, teaching some, to- some kids. I barely spoke English. I spoke more French than English back then. Now that's the other way around. So what, what uh, year, sorry to cut you off, but I just want to nail down the timeline a little bit, Beatrice. So, uh, so uh, It was in 1990, 1990, 1990 when, wow. I, when I came, yes. I came to the U.S. before, but to Miami. I came earlier when it was the... <laughs> this is a story that probably never told anybody, but um, during the during the Pinochet uh, dictatorship, I was considered to be like um, one of the talented sport person. So I got some support. I mean, n- not that much really, but you know, my my grandfather supported me financially to be able to play around. But also the government assisted me. You know, with a few trips here and there. So then um, when there was, a, how do you say this, a referendum in which people needed to vote if they wanted an election or not before going into a democracy. It was a transition period. And as somebody who was supported by a system that I didn't agree with, you know, I never agree with a dictatorship, uh, but... I was, you know, I was somebody good in what I did, and it was a normal thing for everybody to get support to some degree. I got a very little support. So they were they were asking me to go and talk on their behalf, to go to a stadium and talk about, you know, the, their, the Pinochet system. And I didn't want to do it. And I felt a lot of pressure. And I didn't agree, and I wanted... So at that point, I came to the U.S. I came to Miami. For like two months um, that was in the period it was in November so I came in November so if you you were excused to vote if uh, you were traveling abroad so I left the country and I came here for like a month and two so I play a lot in Miami and I got to I never taught chess in Miami I think wiki says that I was there but I was just there. I play a lot in the clubs and Coral Gables. They had a very good club, and I made some good friends. I went to the Capablanca Chess Club in Miami. I gave a few simos. You know, it was a lot of fun actually. I went to the beach a lot. I studied a lot mm-hmm. of chess, chess. So, and maybe it was like a month and a half while I was sorting things out. 
And then I went back to Chile. I played in the national championship uh, for women, and I won. I played in the South American championship in Bolivia. I got second place. And then um, I came to the U.S. again to play chess, and just for a while, and then going back there. No, I was very young, 24. So, um, so then I, I ended up staying here. And I wanted to make my life in chess, you know, and I, and I have done that, you know, with all up, the ups and downs of yeah. dedicating your life to chess, especially back then, almost 30 years ago. Yeah, a lot of downs back then. I mean, I'm not speaking for you personally, but just just generally, the the chess world has come a long way. So I can I can imagine it must have been um, must have been tough at the beginning. Well, I, I had a vision. I saw it. I could tell. You know, something told me when I came to New York. I could feel the energy of the city, and then when I started seeing Dalton, you know, I, I started assisting at Dalton School. And there is when I said to myself, you know, I want to make a difference. I always wanted to make a difference. And I wanted to teach in public schools. I want to work in, you know, I want to get to know what this is about. And and thankfully, I was able to get a job with the New York City Board of Ed. And I started teaching chess in the curriculum in public school number nine in 1993. And then... um, you know, and, and the Anderson program, it would, they used to share the same building back then. So I, I taught in both places. I did chess in the curriculum, K-5, and I taught the special ed and bilingual education. Um, so I had that golden opportunity. And then I, I have so much energy that I felt like I wanted to do more. Like I started programs, you know, where, you know, I, PS6 was already there, but I have the... You know, I was introduced there, and I met Carmen Fariña, who eventually became a New York City school chancellor, and she was a fantastic person. And I remember that she asked me, you know, I went for an an interview with her because I wanted to do the chess program, and she started asking me questions. (laughs) And at some point she told me, you know, they had a program before, but it it didn't really take off. He, she said, you are the only chess teacher I met who never asked me about money. Hmm. <laughs> she was the principal. I said, that, she said, I'm so impressed by that. You're not asking the money. You just want to do something. And she said, I want to give you the opportunity. So we started there. Eventually, BS6 uh, started chess in the curriculum as well. And I got involved in other programs around the city, doing very well. Um, at that point, in 1996, like three years later, I wanted to do more. I, I said, you know, this can be really big and we can do it all over the country. So um, they were opening a position at the U.S. Chess Federation for a scholastic director. And I applied for the job. And I, there were like 30, 30 plus applicants and um, it was interesting that a lot of people didn't think I could do the job because I spoke English as a second language, because I, I was a foreigner, a woman, Latina. And a process, in the end, I made it to the, la- to the top three, to the last three candidates. And, and, and the, I got the job. I got some support from friends like Bob Ferguson, who I'm very grateful. He was on the board of the Federation at the time. I used to work in his castle chess camps too. Mm-hmm. So he knew me personally. He knew my energy, my decided to do things. Um, so they gave me that opportunity. And I was there for almost five years. And I worked seven days a week. I went around the country. I did seminars. I did projects. I took a pay cut, like $20,000 pay cut. Wow. I didn't care. I just wanted to do something. And, and, um, I, and I... I I moved to New Windsor, New York. I didn't know how to drive. Imagine hmm. living upstate New York with no, uh, you know, no yeah. car, no, no, no driver's license. So, yeah, so I learned how to drive. I bought a car, um, you know, and just did it, you know. And I think I did a good job. And um, And then at some point I figured, you know, that I saw how things were going on with the national scholastics and the organizers 
they were beating out all those tournaments. And I decided to that the Federation could do a lot better and provide consistency to these events and enhance the events for the kids and for the families and for the chess community by running the event from the office. And of course, everybody didn't think it was possible to do it from the office. And it was who will do it and this and that. And I said, I will do it. So, and this created a lot of a situation where, you know, organizers, they started fighting to keep their business. But I didn't think it, it was fair for the Federation not to run these events. I mean, they could have done better for the community, but also better financially. So I went ahead and I did it. I fought all the battles. I talked to everybody in the committee. I got the blessings from the committee, from the board. And I organized the first national championship, national scholastic championship from the USCF office. That was back in 1999. That's another thing that nobody knows. I did it in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. Uh, Bill Goichmer helped me. Bill helped me to, to find the venue. I mean, I had a lot of suggestions, and I went around, and I looked at the hotel, and we did the tournament. Right, just and to, then, hmm? Sorry, just to clarify, are these the grade school nationals? Grade school nationals K through 12. I thought that was the right one because... That tournament was created in 94 or 95. So by the year 1999, it's still not that big. It was like, we were, you know, it was a good tournament to, to organize. And just we for just to clarify for foreign listeners, uh, what uh, what Beatrice is referring to is, so in the United States, we have, um, we have different systems of different nationals uh, traditionally and for for many decades going back to at least the 1960s you might know exactly when they started but we have like an elementary school nationals a junior high nationals and a high school nationals so basically three discrete sections where you have kids based on ages but then as Beatrice is referring to in the 1990s they created a uh, separate grade school nationals that happens uh, in typically in December, as opposed to in April or May. And in this one, individuals compete at each grade level, at every single grade level, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and so on and so forth. So this was the, the tournament that Beatrice was helping to to grow in, in the 1990s. So, sorry. No, I, I organized the first one from the USCF office in 1999 because I believe that the Federation should be running the U.S. chess now, they call it, should be running these tournaments. And um, and it happens, you know, and it has been a good change. And, and then, you know, somebody that was in the year two, 1999, I worked for the Federation until the year 2000. And then I started doing other things, my own programs. Um, and then in 2003... I became president, the first woman president of the U.S. Chess Federation. Um, I, somebody convinced me to run for the board, and I didn't know how the situation was. I got elected. It was the first election for one one member, one vote. I mean, people didn't even have to register as they do it now. The bylaws change. So I got elected. I got the most votes in the one member, one vote election. Um, I didn't think I would be president. I was new on the board. I thought, you know, I would just be a board member and learn and try to help. But then, you know, I started realizing all the problems that they were having. And when we went to Los Angeles for the annual meeting, the executive director didn't show, um, you know, his excuse was illnesses, then, and he resigned at the same time. The auditor's report um, came about, and, um, and the Federation was basically going belly up. That means it was going bankrupt. And we, didn't, we had huge debt, a building in New York that needed a lot of repairs. We didn't have any money. The building was a collateral you know, for the line of credit of $300,000 that was completely covered. So we had huge debt, no cash, um, a big overhead, because back then we used to run the book and equipment business. So we had a, 
you know, it's huge, huge overhead. So it was a big responsibility. We got to the meeting, I was such a chaos that somehow I ended up becoming the, the president of the organization. So I think the new board members uh, at the time, um, Tim Hankin, um, Tim, uh, he figured out that if everything continues the same way, it will be the end of the organization. Um, so I got support, and I became president. You may think it's a great honor, but it hmm. was a major nightmare. You know, I couldn't work for one year. I have to basically do this full time uh, to be able to turn the situation around. A lot of people help, you know, so many good people. But at the same time, it was uh, it was a huge challenge that um, they took a lot out of me, you know, out of my life and out of my health, you know. I, the same year I was diagnosed with kidney disease, and eventually, you know, in 2005, 2007, I got a kidney transplant. But I was there from 2003 to 2005 as president and in the board until 2009. So, um, yeah, it's, it has been quite a journey. Um, I have done the best I can, you know, to help. And, but it has been worth it, you know. I think in my contributions to Scholastic Chess and then later on in FIDE to Social Chess, and also for supporting children with disabilities and, and chess. And, um, and I also am the president of Checkmate in Dementia. I think you wanted to talk about yeah, that I too. Want, I want to talk programs. about all of these things, <laughs> but I, I, I want to get a little bit more of the living history of U.S. chess just because it was such a tumultuous time. And it, it's so heartening to see that they're doing doing so, so well now, uh, thanks in no small part to, to your efforts. So you mentioned that you had a lot of help, but... Um, what just out of curiosity, what uh, what changes did you guys make? What how were you able to write the ship? Well, we realized, you know, because before there were, you know, we used to run the book and equipment business, um, so the budget was about five million dollars. The federation, and um, and it was mostly because we needed to run this business, but. We didn't make any money with the business. We were losing money with the business. Um, maybe it was a good idea to try to keep it because we had a very good tax um, tax exemption. So we didn't have to, although the federation is, at the time, it was a 501c4. That means a mem a, it was a membership organization, non-for-profit organization. Um, the, we had a tax uh, break. But at the same time, nobody knew how to run the business. We were leaking all over. So I understood that the book and equipment business was one of the biggest problems. And, you know, so we needed to think about outsourcing this. And we did. So for better or for worse, that was outsourced. And we eliminated part of that, you know, a lot of the overhead because we turn this deal into like now we basically have somebody who pays you know a year gr fee to run the business for the federation so it's not that the federation loves the business it's just outsourcing um so i guess i don't know how much exactly now i'm not current with the numbers but over a hundred thousand dollars a year so something that was losing money uh, now it makes money um, maybe it was possible to keep it, but we couldn't afford to keep everybody. But my first action was something that was extremely painful for me because it's not my nature. You know, I grow things, I develop things, I don't destroy or cut things. Uh, my first action was to let go of 18 people. So we needed to basically reduce the staff by 18 and... I got advice from the lawyers, and you know, we didn't we didn't have a choice. We didn't have the funds to pay them. Um, you know, Stan Booth, who's from Pennsylvania. I don't know if you know him. Say the name again. Stan Booth. Uh -huh. He was the chair of the finance committee 
and he's also an auditor. So he, um, he, he came with his business partner from the auditing firm, and we actually opened the books and we started looking at everything. I mean, before we did make this decision, we did a deep analysis of the finances, and we understood exactly where we were losing money. Uh, so we needed to downside. Um, so letting people go, it was a natural thing to do, but one of the most painful things that I have done in my life. Um, then, you know, we started cutting costs and everything we could, including the magazine. Just life, we had a small version of the magazine for a while. We couldn't print all the pages. Oh, you know, so then, um, yeah, we, we went into an emergency mode and until we were able to stabilize. I got on the phone and I borrowed money from different people, <laughs> you know, state <laughs> associations, you know, that they, that because we couldn't make payroll and we couldn't pay for the magazine to, to be printed or to be mailed out. So it was a very, very difficult situation and that requires just, full attention. Yeah. Sorry, one, one more follow-up. So, and I know you mentioned that you, when you were running for director, you didn't, you didn't um, have an idea. You weren't you weren't aware of the level of the problem. So, did you have an inkling of what you were signing up for, or was it like a total shock when when you became director and then saw what the numbers looked like in terms of uh, the finances of the U.S. Chess Federation? When I agreed to run, um, I didn't know. But then, I just, as I was, you know, learning more about the organization, I started seeing some red flags. And I started seeing problems, you know, in the office and the morale. The politics was awful, you know. I got a piece of that myself, you know, in the sense that I was attacked constantly. But back then, everybody was, they were attacking constantly. Terrible politics, a lot of attacks in the Internet. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that I was signing up for something like this. And I didn't know that I have to put my own life and hold to be able to turn around an organization that couldn't die. And we needed to make some important decisions. I mean, including the LMA, which is the life, um, is the LMA is a life um, member's asset fund. Now, now it's a trust. But back then it was a fund. Um, and we didn't have any money there. You know, they basically spent almost $2 million in like five, six years. And, I mean, they had a very bad management for a while. And, um, you know, we didn't have anything. And, you know, I think whatever we have, it was it was a hundred something thousand we spent it in trying to pay the line of credit and free the building so we wouldn't lose it. Um, but then I decided, and the board decided more than anything, you know, you have to work well with the board that uh, we needed to keep the LMA. And now the LMA, and I have been a member of the LMA since then. And we got a new building in Tennessee. We sold the old one. And we paid the mortgage for the new building a long time ago. We did it very quickly. And the LMA has good funds now. Uh, so the Federation has these reserves and they have the LMA money, so they're in pretty good shape nowadays. But it was very complicated, very difficult, and it, I was under a lot of attack, you know, a lot of prodigies also, you know. There was an attack in the Internet where people thought, I mean, somebody said that, you know, that I would steal the USCF money and run to South America with the money. <laughs> just because I'm South American, you know, right. I was born in Chile. But uh, I'm sure they wouldn't say that to somebody else. But obviously, you know, that would have never happened. And it was sad to see that people will believe something like that, you know. And then uh, they created the f fake Sam Sloan. And I don't know if you want to talk about that. but I feel and, like we should a little, a little bit. There, and the real Sam Sloan. I mean, all these characters that they were attacking. And eventually we found out who that person was, you know. And it's somebody who's still there, you know. But um, so it has been uh, quite a journey. I'm happy that I'm not that involved with the Federation anymore. I'm happy that I'm 
you know, then I went to FIDE because I wanted to do something. Okay, yeah, because <laughs> one, was, <laughs> one yeah, struggling one organization another, wasn't enough. So I'm try, trying to think of how to put this politely, but I mean, FIDE had many issues of its own. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're, you're, you're yes, a saint, Beatrice. Yes. So, so okay, yeah. sorry, you go to FIDE. <laughs> Yeah, so then I would, because I wanted to do something. Again, I always have this ambition, you know. And um, when I went there, I think initially it was because I went, they asked me to go to uh, to meet with Vega and Jorge Vega, Latin America. They wanted to sort of meet, help or reach with Latin America since I speak Spanish. I was born in Latin America. Um, that became... A journey by itself and it was very complicated with me to work with people from other cultures that they have other values and you see what they do and at the same time you don't know what to do about it and you want to do something good and you want to you know so I have been trying to to be transparent and say as much as possible, but trying to fix the system from within. Um, I saw good things too. I mean, it was it's not all negative, you know. And um, and well, my thinking, my biggest accomplishment in FIDE, I was the first woman elected FIDE uh, vice president. It was that in 2002, or oh, 2012, sorry, I created the Social Action Commission and the other commission as well. I mean, it was pressure to do this, but so I was the one who wrote the description for each commission. And, and I studied that work that was so important and so unique, which was to use chess for social, you know, as a social tool for development, for improvements, to make people's life better. And to me, that was extremely rewarded. And that was the main reason why I stayed there, because I I felt like I could contribute. So we did programs in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, Europe also. So that opportunity was very enriching for me, and I was very happy that I could do it. So that's... But again, I, I operated with a very small budget. I have to do miracles. I have to use my own. I never got paid. My own time. Um, everybody in my position was flying business. I didn't fly business. I used the money to help people. You know? Everyone from um, FIDE was? Well, at the time, people in the presidential board, it was a policy that if the flight was for longer than four, four hours, you can fly business. And obviously, if you go from America to Europe, you understand that it's always longer than four hours. So America too. <laughs> so I could always fly business. And wow. I didn't. That, yeah. you know. I mean, that is ridiculous that everyone else was doing that. <laughs> well, the people that could. Yeah. And sometimes all these guys, they were in the front of the plane and I was in the back and doing all this work, <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, my God. I mean, they must think I'm an idiot, you know. <laughs> But okay, I beat it. I was happy to do it. And then yeah. getting getting um, a lot of heat from the outside world for, for even being a member of, of Exactly, exactly. And you couldn't, I mean, it's very interesting because it, you, you know what is going on. You understand what is wrong with an organization. You know, when an organization becomes dysfunctional, uh, but at the same time, if you come out and try to attack it or, or be negative about it, you don't make things better. So you have to try to fix things from within. And uh, But I saw a lot of good people, too, that have good intentions. But they were very tricky people. They always have other motives and other agendas. And well, they're chess I have to sort of, Yeah, I have to play the fool many right. times. You know, they probably they thought I was, I was not very bright, you know. But I just did it, you know. I just did my part, did my job always focusing on the goals of doing something good for chess. Um, but then I, when I said I, I, I'm done, I don't want to continue on FIDE, it was, I meant it. I didn't want to continue. You know, I still want to see some friends in FIDE. I have friends there. But uh, I am not interested in any 
powerful position in the USGS or FIDE. I mean, what I do now in the council, Scholastic Council, or, their, or the LMA Trust, um, you know, for me as a contribution is volunteer time, you know, but um, I, know I don't want to be, you know, I wish my profile was much, you know, I was more low profile than I am. Because at some point when you do so much and people get to know you and you have all these titles, you know, people get the wrong idea. And that was never my intention. I just wanted to get things done. So we we mentioned that the U.S. chess is looking a lot better than it did in those fraught years for the chess world uh, in the aughts, the zero zeros. Um what about, what's your current impression? I know that you've stepped down from most of your formal roles with FIDE and that Dalton is keeping you pretty busy, but uh, what's, what's your impression of the, uh, the direction of FIDE under uh, Dvorkovic's uh, leadership? Well, I think a change is good. Um, I was happy to see a change. Um, you know, it's, uh, but then it's always, you get mixed feelings because obviously... You get to know people and you you wish them to do the best. But I think for they were there for so long. And that was good to make a change. But what I see now is that the new leadership, they have good intentions. and But it, they haven't put their act together. You know, some of the commissions, they're not working well, including the Social Action Commission. I think it's, it's a shame, you know. I couldn't continue doing it, um, but they don't. They are they are not active, and um, the development commission is doing a lot more, is undertaking many of those responsibilities. Um, improvements. I think the world championship cycle looks interesting. The women world championship. They changed the format, which was much needed. Um, the tournaments are taking place, which is important. You know. But um, but I think very soon uh, the the FIDE president Arkady Vorkovich will find out that he's you know although what he's doing for chess is important you know because he's the president and he's using all his connections and his political influence to help chess he he will find out that. A lot of people around him are not there for the right reasons, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the 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 chess world needs to become more professional, and you need to stop politicians or people who have political ambitions to run things, especially if they don't have a salary, because they will try to figure it out to make it work for themselves. Um, so it should be, yeah, they have stuff. FIDE is extremely complex, you know, it's a very complicated uh, organization. But now they have a lot of people that they want to solve their financial situation there. And I don't think uh, that's good for chess. It was the same before, by the way, with mm-hmm. the previous administration. And the previous administration was compromised, you know. Yeah. So it has been a, an ongoing problem. And I don't think it's going away now. Right. Well, similar to probably when you took over U.S. chess, uh, everything can't change at once. It's, you can, it's There's so many issues that you kind of have to pick a few. Um, I, I personally, I mean, I'm obviously, you know, the principles of FIDE uh, infinitely better than I do. But from my perspective, I'm just glad to have someone as president who's not under sanctions and is able to travel freely uh, for starters. Um but I, I definitely get what you're saying about um, big, bigger changes being needed. Uh, I agree. I think he's very, very good. I think the current president has the best intentions. Um, and uh, there are a lot of good people there. And let me tell you something that will sound very controversial. Kersana Lujinov was under sanctions. And he's eccentric. He made comments that, you know, like the aliens and that <laughs> shocked the world. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, what I saw on him, I mean, he was, it's one of those people that find himself climbing, in, you know, climbing up in a system that is very complicated. And, you know, he, 
he really loved chess and he tried to do something for chess too. He spent a lot of his personal money and connections to help chess. He gave a lot to chess. Well, there are a lot but of people who, who think that he extracted money from chess. So you think that he was contributing money to it? I mean, to Fide, yes. Maybe to chess is a different question. I mean, maybe people are thinking that he was able to get deals and make some money from it. I, I never saw anything like that. Never saw anything like that. I saw that, you know, when Fide needed to do some events and we didn't have the fans to do it, he would figure it out a way to do it. Right, I never saw could, him extracting any money from Fide. Yeah, although that could be suspicious. And I mean, I guess he's trying to promote chess, but it might have been in his interest. It's, you know, it's hard hard to know. Although certainly from your perch, if you never saw anything illicit, that's... Uh... No, I never saw anything like that. Quite the opposite. Um, but I thought, actually, I always question that. I mean, why he's willing to do all of this? And um, and at some point, I came up with the idea, and I don't know if it's true. Other people thought the same, actually. I spoke with other people, but I, would, I don't know if it was true or not. I thought that he needed Fide for his own safety in Russia. You know, safety not just um, physically, you know, not, not physically, but to keep his political to have an international position, mm -hmm. you know, that could be prominent enough for him to be in contact with other people that was important people. So he needed he needed this for connections mostly, you know. Do you, but do I don't you, think he'd ever take any money from Fidel. I don't remember. At some point in the end, because he was kind of broke, Fidel started paying some of his expenses. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Um, but for many years... He gave a lot of money to feed him, millions and millions of dollars. And do you know what he's up to this, these days since he has stepped down as I president? have no idea. I don't have any contact with okay. him. I have no idea. Okay. Well, Beatrice, I appreciate you talking about all this. I know it's not the most pleasant subject, and I know your work has been thankless, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah. So I, I, I personally want to thank you. I mean, I think your heart's in the right place, and I, you know... Um, and I appreciate you're talking about it so openly, but let's let's move on to brighter topics. Okay, um, perfect. So uh, we have a few to circle back to. One of which um, is uh, the work you've done with um, to promote chess as a vehicle to stave off Alzheimer's. And I, I mentioned that to the Patreon supporters of the podcast who get notice of the guests. And we got a question from supporter of the podcast, Michael Can, um, and Michael asks. He says, Ms. Medanello, thank you for raising awareness about using chess to delay Alzheimer's. My wife has the second most common form of dementia, which doesn't get as much publicity. It's called Lewy body dementia. Robin Williams died from it. Perhaps chess can help out a little with that disease also. Thank you so much for your educational endeavors. Yeah, well, since, you know, I, you sent me that message yesterday, I looked at the disease and I realized that over a million people in the U.S. suffer from that disease, which is an early form of dementia. Um, and it's the second most common form of dementia, actually. And a lot of people, they, don't, they haven't been diagnosed. But from my end, I mean, I think it, you know, you have to look at chess as a, not just a game. I mean, chess is like, um, it's a lot more than a game. <laughs> it's, but um, chess has been, has been evolving and surviving for thousands of years and then and adjusting and changing and incorporating new pieces to the game, new rules. And somehow humans, we still have interest in chess because we can see it compatible with so many things nowadays with technology, you know, with the internet, with education, you know, because chess is helping I mean, if you play chess, you start learning how to think critically, you know, critical thinking. Um, to, you can develop abilities, you know, you have to be creative. But also chess has great importance in social applications. And, you know, for a start, it's, it's, an, it's an equalizer. It's a game that it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from how old are you, are you once you sit across the board to play you know it does you know you can play the game so it's really an equalizer 
and it's, it gives a lot of confidence. So for education, it's very clear the benefit. But for social also, you know, it's a, it's a game that can help people give a lot of good self-esteem and that can help them, that can encourage them to be more educated, to pursue bigger goals. But then you might be thinking, why checkmate in dementia? I said this, I have been saying this for years. And at some point, with a friend of, uh, with the help of my friend, Michael Glassman, we created an organization called um, Checkmate in Dementia. Um, I would, and I did a little bit of this and feed it too. I wanted to do it for Alzheimer's, for seniors. So why chess? It's basically because it's fitness, brain fitness. And keeping the brain active is one of the ways how you can delay, you know, some um, illnesses associated associated with brain uh, brain aging. You know, some people develop different pathologies, you know, like in this case, you know, some early forms of dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, but the bottom line is 100% of the population, we're going through the same process. Our brains are aging. And as we get older, we forget things. Uh, we, uh, our memory is not there anymore. Um, our brains become slower. It's hard to process information. Um, and I think if chess can help with this, I mean, not just chess, reading, keeping the brain active. So I think the chess will take a very important place in the future in the prevention of illnesses associated with brain aging. And, um, and that's why, and not just the chest, you know, there are, for people with dementia or Alzheimer's, I mean, sugar, obviously, you need to eliminate sugar from your diet, and low carbs, there are some food that they're not very good, and try to exercise as well, keep the body active, a healthy diet, and keep the, the brain active. So everybody talks about diet, everybody talks about keeping the brain, the body active exercising, but not that many people talk about keeping the brain active. And I think there is when chess has extremely, I mean, it's extremely valuable because chess is very complex. To begin with, when you play chess, you use both sides of the brain. That means the blood and the brain moves in different directions. When you read, the, the blood circulates in one direction at a time. Hmm. Well, but then when you do some Reasoning maybe you can go in a different direction. But chess, basically, when you play the game, when you know the rules, everybody can learn the rules. It's an easy game to learn. But then when you play it, when you strategize, when you start solving problems, you start using your brain in a way that can help you keep the brain younger. And... Um, and I, there, you know, there is no cure for Alzheimer's and for dementia. I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, but at the same time, you can delay the progression of the illness, illnesses. Um, and for people who have families with other people with Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's, I think it's one of the most painful things to see that their relatives are losing their you know, the ability to think and they cannot reason and then at some point they, they cannot even function. So I think we should consider chess as one of the top 10 activities that humans can do to uh, to keep the brains in, in good shape. And that's extremely important. And the prevention doesn't start when you're in your 50s. It starts when you're a child. You know, I think you need to engage in a lifetime idea that it's good to use the body, it's important to use the brain, you know, it's important to use, to have the right nutrition, it's ongoing, you know, that can help us, that can help humans to stay healthy. And that's another issue, you know, the social, the, 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 the cost of these illnesses, mm -hmm. you know. In, in the U.S. it's estimated that, you know, that, I don't know how many million people. I think it's about 100 million people around the world that they have dementia or more. I don't know. 
So it's millions and millions of people that they need care. And if you delay these diseases, you help the quality of life for the families, but also you help the system overall. And they're developing countries that they don't have the means to take care of people with dementia. Um, so then the families, they have to undertake the responsibility. So I think it's important for us. I mean, it's one of the most valuable things about chess. Not only that you learn critical thinking and you can, you know, by if you have the right chess teachers and guidance, you can help children to develop also good emotional intelligence. Um, but also engaging in a lifetime practice of keeping the brain active and giving people the pleasure of thinking, you know, that you figured out something. Same thing with reading, solving puzzles. You know, so many things that they're so fun to do that sometimes people don't do it. I think if we spend too much time watching TV, including myself. I love some movies and things. But um, one thing that happened with TV television, Ben, is that the processing part of the brain stops. Mm-hmm. And if you don't use the processing part of the brain, at some point, if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's extremely important for us to use time to do like playing chess. So that's why, you know, and, and it, uh, not just because I love chess, I think it's something that I hope that the medical community will em- embrace at some point and say, and say to people, keep your brains active. Learn checkers. Chess is even more interesting because each piece moves differently. And so the process is more complex and it's better for the brain. But, um, and the other thing is the brain has plasticity. So you can actually develop abilities. You can enhance your cognitive abilities. You can uh, elevate your IQ, you know. And, um, and that's another thing. That's why my interest also in working with or providing opportunities for, you know, young people with disabilities. One of them is not just development, it's also because I feel like it's so unfair that some people, they need to live in a certain way. And people look at them like they cannot do other things. And I think we have to empower them to do as much as they can with their, within their limitations. But when it comes to physical disabilities, I mean, uh, chess is really important. You can do it, and it can help you to deal with your emotions. Chess is very emotional. It's a very inside of you when you play chess. It's a personal thing. It's a it's a world by itself that you can live in there, and it's very warm and nice. It's extremely close to you. I, ben, I think you probably you understand what I'm talking about. Of course, you know? yeah. Yeah, they, so, but dementia, I think it definitely, and helping people that to learn chess, to diversify the, ch- the game, uh, you know, to give access to minorities, people, you know, it's, it's extremely important. That has been my mission. Um, and if I did anything in politics, it was always to advance the mission. And when I went, when I was president of the U.S. Chess Federation, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to do more with chess and education. And I couldn't do it because the organization was dying. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to feel, I said, I'm not going to allow any of the politics to stop me from doing what I want to do. They didn't want me to do chess in the schools. They have a different plan. That, okay, that's fine. But then I wanted to do this social chess. And I made a difference. And to me... You know, that made me feel good, you know, and goal-oriented. I I'm, I'm I don't believe in power just for the sake of power, you know, or to get money out of it. I don't believe in that. I work really hard, and what I believe is that the benefits of chess and how we can, all of us, can we do something to help other people through chess, to basically use chess to do good things, you know, to do good for humans, Um Hopefully that will help us, you know, to have a better society in the future. Yeah, uh, I definitely, uh, I think that, I mean, all of these initiatives are important, but the checkmating Alzheimer's one, I think is particularly important because people like myself and a lot of chess chess teachers listen to this program 
Uh, I feel like there's there's still plenty of room for scholastic chess initiatives to grow, but at least at least they're on an upward path. But but the the elderly can be overlooked in things in situations like this. Um, and I I do think uh that it's 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 really important and it's indisputably valuable that as you say things like chess and crossword puzzles and Sudoku and reading are, are really important in order to maintain the fitness of the brain. So. Um, what does so other than raising awareness? What what can people do uh, to to help people make to help uh, grow uh, this initiative? Well, the, the 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 mission of Checkmate in Dementia was basically two, but we haven't get to the second part because it's very expensive. It was one to start chess programs, and the second to do research. Research is extremely expensive and complicated. Although we have a doctor in the board, Dr. Freiland, who is the person who wrote um, articles for the New England uh, Journal. And he has done extensive research for dementia. It's, um, and he's a professor in a university in, in Kentucky. So, um, yeah, they, I think what people can do that is easy to do in chess clubs have start programs for seniors. We have one at the Marshall Chess Club on Mondays that is very successful, it's free. Um, we subsidize the program. Um, we don't have the means to subsidize programs around the country. But um, if, you know, you want to start program for seniors, it's a very good idea. The only thing is, it's very different than teaching children and teaching other people. And you have to make it more social. You have to make it more appealing for se- seniors. Uh, I, I wish uh, we can videotape the program that we have at the Martian. It's so successful, so fun, and the seniors are fully engaged. And they want to learn more, and they're setting up their goals. I mean, imagine people in their 70s, 80s learning how to play chess. And one of the most interesting things is that most seniors that they attend this program, they're women. Oh, that's great. So you can you see that older people, they're mostly women, uh, that they are interested in taking this because they didn't have the chance when they were younger or because they didn't feel secure enough, you know, when they were little girls to learn chess or they didn't think it was something that they could do. Now they want to do it. So in, in all the programs that we have done, we always have the majority are women. And... So, yeah, I think it's, it's something that you can do in your communities, a start chess program for seniors. Just come, embrace, teach people one step at a time. Don't try to bring the best chess players in town to play together. That's not the idea. Teach people how to play chess, seniors how to play chess. You know, start with the way how we do it with the kids. You know, with one piece at a time, build it up. Same thing with the seniors. Take your time, prepare some material for them to review because their memory is not there, so they need things in writing to always refresh. Um, yeah, and basically just keep them engaged. It's very doable, it's very low cost, and it's a very good thing to do. That's great. That's that's really good advice. So in terms of making it uh, more social, I guess that means like less lecture time and more sort of interaction no, it could be a lot of teaching, but you need to make it that friendly for people to be there. Mm-hmm. Chess is intimidating for people. You know, when you go to a club and you see all these people that they look so smart and so serious. serious. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's yeah. like you want to run away from that place. Right. It's like this is no fun. You know, so you need to have people that they 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 are also community service high schoolers coming to help spend time with the seniors, you know, create that synergy between the young and the old. Um, it's also very positive. Okay. Well, that that's great advice. Um, so before I let you go, Beatrice, I know you're super busy, but we've got to get some, well, I have a, a couple more topics, actually. Uh, okay. num- number one, I did come across an old interview of yours. Uh, I believe it was on chess base. Um, uh, although there was no author attributed, so I can't can't mention who the interview was with. But you mentioned you've got some some great Bobby Fisher stories that you've been holding out on the world. 
<laughs> I think you should interview Dr. Leroy Dubeck. Okay. Who was president of the U.S. Chess when he was a world champion. Uh, he shared many of these stories with me and close friends. But um, I think you will get a better flavor, a better yeah, idea, you know, about... Yeah, there are many things. I mean, and I think... It, I can tell you some of the story. One of them is published, but there are many actually. It would be a good person to to ask because okay. he was there and he's yeah, and still he's, around. He's, and he's you know, been he's around. in his eighties. Yeah, so he's, I think it's about time to remember somebody yeah. to contact him and get and get that those stories that he was able to leave firsthand. You know. Okay. Yeah, that is, I'll move him to the top of the line because uh, yeah, yeah, he's done so much for chess, and yeah, yeah. he's got some stories to tell. We got to get them. But if you have one, you could share uh, as a teaser. Well, as a teaser, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> one of them he told me. Well, there are many stories, uh, but there, you know, that in some point, the U.S. was able to take control over FIDE, and that was actually to make Fisher play the match the world championship match, it was quite a journey because he didn't play in the U.S. championship the year that he qualified for the interzonal, actually. Um, the U.S. is a zone. I don't, back then, it was a system that, you know, they have zones, then they have interzonals. Basically, the winners of the zones, they go to an interzonal, and then from the interzonal, they will play the candidate uh, matches. And then finally, they will produce one challenger who will play the world champion. Um, so Fisher didn't play the Sonal, didn't play in the U.S. championship because he disagreed with a prize fan, the format of the tour, the format of the tournament. You know, Fisher was like that. He 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 has his own ideas, and he didn't want to compromise. Um, but then. Um, you know, two people, actually three people, didn't play in the interzonal, so Fisher could have a chance to play. One of them was Benko, another one was uh, Bill Lombardi, and I don't know who was the third one. But they basically step aside, and they allow Fisher to play in the candy, in the in the interzonal. And then he won the interzonal, and he was able to play the candidate matches. You know that he won very. So the story goes. At some point, Fisher supposed to play Petrosian, right? Mm -hmm. But previously, um, there was a, gen a FIDE General Assembly in Puerto Rico, and the Russian de delegation was there. And the head of the Russian delegation um, was, you know, the Leroy can tell you the story, but they saw him in, in, a, in a situation that was a bit complicated, um, kind of embarrassing with a lady <laughs> of the night, you know. They and obviously, they saw hmm? Petro. They saw who in this situation? They saw the the, the delegate of the, the ah, Soviet. Okay. Yeah, and there was Emerson, who was uh, executive director of the U.S. Chess Federation, and before that, he was a colonel in the army, and he was connected to the government, you know, high positions in the government. And this was a time of the Cold War, obviously. So they took some photos of him, um, of the Soviet guy. Hmm. And then when the time came that they needed to decide where Fisher would play with Petrosian, the, the Soviets, they wanted to play in Russia. And Fisher wanted to play in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. So the story goes, the official story goes, that basically they flip the coin, <laughs> the head of the U.S. chess and the head of the Soviets. But my friend told me that there was no coin. <laughs> there were pictures. <laughs> <laughs> no, no coin. <laughs> exactly. There were, there were pictures. <laughs> so Fisher ended up pay, playing in Buenos Aires, which was a, a very important for him, you know, because... He oh, was man. extremely paranoid, yeah. and then he would have feared that they, they would have given him moves, you know, so yeah. he, would, he, he played in Buenos right, Aires. Yeah. And in Buenos Aires, they did a fantastic job. They built, like, a cabin or something. Like, he played, actually, in a fish tank. I don't know if you, you know the story. 
um, they put in a, in a mass in a huge fish tank in a glass container where people could see the games, but they couldn't hear anything. And then, you know, so he was very happy playing there. And obviously, he won. He basically crashed Petrosian, you know. And <laughs> so, and he was able to qualify to play for the World Championship match with Steinitz. I mean, with uh, Spassky in uh, in Reykjavik. But that's one of the many stories. I think um, the U.S. did so much to try to to make Fisher a world champion. And then when he became a world champion, they have lined up for him like millions and millions of dollars in a sponsorship. And Fisher didn't want to play anymore. And there are many theories about this. Okay? Many people talk about it, why he didn't want to play. Some people believe that he thought that he would not win the game, the match with Karpov, because the Soviet already figured it out how he played, his opening, his style. It was like an army of people versus himself and a few others. So, so that's one thing. But I truly believe that was not the reason. I thought that at that point, Fischer would have won against Karpov. I think the reason was exactly why he didn't play in the, U- in the U.S. championship. He didn't agree with the conditions of the match. And there were people who basically worked against him in FIDE at the time, 1970s, early 1970s. And um, they knew that Fisher would not agree to play the match if they didn't agree to that in case that the champion ties the match, it remains a champion. And that's exactly what they did. So for the match, they were saying if the champion... You know, he couldn't. He they, they they couldn't give him the chance to remain a champion if the the the, the match was a tie. And um, and that was a deal breaker for him. Well, that's <laughs> you may have different versions of these stories, but they're all fascinated and a big fan actually. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and he is nothing if not fascinating. Whatever, whatever your overall opinion. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, some some great stories. So I would definitely, I'll definitely try to try to get uh, Doctor Dubeck on on the show. Um, and uh, last topic. Thank you for that, for that great story, Beatrice. Um, <laughs> okay. Last topic is if you have favorite chess books or favorite books generally. Um, uh, we're we'll uh, we'll cut short a little bit on the the overall chess improvement recommendations, unless you have a particular insight you want to share. But it would be great to get some book recommendations. <laughs> Well, I, I think kids now should be encouraged to do a lot of tactics. Um, do it online, do it in papers, with books, and then work with a coach or a teacher to um, to give them what they need in terms of judging positions, understanding the positions, learning how to choose the right plans. I think um, they're great books, but you cannot recommend somebody. It's, it's the long way to learn. It's obsolete. Um, what you could learn in 10 years around my time when I started playing chess in the 1980s, um, you know, early 1980s, now you can learn in two years mm-hmm. by using technology. I think it's much better to just take a coach who provides good coach, provides the guidance and motivation and support also. And just do a lot of tactics by yourself. Don't don't ask the coach to give you chess puzzles because that's a complete waste of time. I think as somebody, if you go want to go and teach, you can introduce the theme, the tactical theme, but then you should ask your students to do tactics by themselves. And if they are willing to do it, they're going to get a lot better. Yeah, that's basically the the recipe, in my opinion. I think it use technology. Um, there's so many. I nowadays, you know, I have a lot of chess books <laughs> that I have from before, and uh, some what the books that I read are mostly the ones about that they have more like a personal touch, yeah. like people write about their life, and that to me is interesting. But then the games that I watch, I just follow chess or one of the the online companies that they, you know, chess base, chess twenty four, um, you know, chess dot com, obviously. You know, I just go there and I look at games. But follow chess, I like it. And the other, 
So I think we're, we live in different times. Some books are becoming, unless somebody write a fascinating book about something. I mean, like Kaspar wrote uh, my great pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, what is yeah. and that's, th those are fantastic books because he put a lot of his personal stories there. Carson ended up writing books like that. Or even women. I would like to see more women writing books like that. Like yeah. Huyi Fan. You know, I think we need more women role models in chess. And we need to show more girls games as well. We don't show enough women Do you positions have any, in chess. Do you have any favorite women's games that you that you find yourself showing? Putting you on the spot. Yeah, I, sh I, I show, you know, many, actually. <laughs> you know, I show St. Judith Polgar games. Um, you know, one that she played with, I think it was Parkes. Another oh, Hungarian yeah, Berkus, player yeah, the... where she attacks with she plays... the h pawn. Yeah, so a she lot plays of g4 later. to lock g file and then plays h4. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like you. She, she played wonderful attacking games, and I like that. I think girls, they need to be encouraged to become more, be more aggressive in chess. Um, Polgar's great and, for that. <laughs> yeah, she's great for that. But I also like who you fan. You know, I love the game that she played with David Navarra. You know, the the Caro can defense. Uh, I watch many. You know, Konuro, Stefanova, many many games. I mean, uh, even the U.S. Uh, women players. I I like their games too. I, yeah, I like to watch games. I enjoy doing that. And I think a teachers, chess teachers should show more women's games yeah it's yes. i agree yeah yeah i i've mentioned this before but i try to show a fair amount of women's games in my my chess programs but i always feel like my retention of of girl students even if you account for the fact that more boys are taking chess to begin with i feel like uh the the retention of girl students is is always harder for me uh, as a teacher and i'm constantly trying to figure out how to how to change that yeah i feel the same way it's, it's a challenge um yeah i think the federation is making a good effort in that regard i like the work that jennifer shahari is doing yeah it's great yeah i i i love the work that she's doing actually and um she's a great role model also um so it's good and I like the fact also that all the national national scholastic they have the you know the girls club where you know the girls can go and they do signings and activities and they're yeah I see the effort that is being done in the U.S. to bring awareness to support it's good you know I like uh, what um, Kimberly is doing yeah uh, you know and yeah I mean. Is is going to take time, but it has to happen. You know, we um, we live in different times. Um, I mean, that's another we can talk hours about why. I, I have a, some theories about why we have less girls than boys, but a lot has to do with language. Then, and mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I wanted to do, and sometimes people get a little upset with me because I try to push for things. <laughs> you know, I think uh, all policies, chess policies, should be gender neutral. Um, I think uh, we should include more women in leadership roles. Um, we need to stop the boys' club and having the boys always attacking the, the a woman. Mm -hmm. A woman leader gets a lot of criticism, and it's so hard. And if you say something that people meet, misinterpret, people get very defensive, you know. So um, it's very hard to be a woman in chess because you, it's still very much a men's world. Do you feel like it's getting better? A little bit, not that much. Okay. We're not there yet. But I see good people trying to make a change, mm -hmm. and I'm happy about that. Right. Okay. Well, on that note, Beatrice, I definitely, again, want to thank you for, for all that you've done. Um, uh, as I said before, it, it sounds so thankless. <laughs> it's... Well, let's think about the future. I'm planning to hopefully, you know, and, and I'm going to focus a lot more at Dalton, obviously. And, but I will continue. I, um, I, I would like to organize the, the tournament for the kids, you know, with disabilities and, um, uh, 
and I would like to continue doing some social projects and educational projects. In 2021, I'm going to co-organize a conference in the U.S. I don't know if we will do it based on chess and education or social chess. I think we need to decide that. Um, so that's something that is coming up, and the trust is going to, the U.S. Chess Trust is going to sponsor that. So, or co-sponsor. Great. So um, that's another initiative that I'm looking forward to be part of it. And I think it will be good for everybody. Great. And if people want to uh, contact you, maybe to volunteer and to, to help or just to keep up with your initiatives, Beatrice, what's what's the best way to to keep up with you? Um, I would say maybe maybe Facebook. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I know. sometimes a little personal, but, you know, this. And but your your feed on Facebook is is mostly chess initiatives, I must say. So, um, I, yeah. yeah, I think it's a good way. To any anything that you're involved in, people will be able to to see. And it's uh, public, and you know, I yeah, think, um, it's uh, yeah. I can give you my email address, but I don't want to get uh, a thousand emails from this. And, you know. Okay, so we'll, we'll just <laughs> we'll, we'll just know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just link to your Facebook, um, yeah. and, and leave it at that. But uh, but thank um, you again. And congratulations this was... for what you do too, Ben. Oh, it's thank great. you. It's a pale. I love to... your program. I listen oh. to it all the time. So. Thank great. you. It pales in comparison to to having one's helmet on, navigating the murky waters of FIDE and the USEF. But uh, but it, I'm uh, happy to do it. Yeah, well, I'm not. I'm. I want to make. I I just want to do it for you know to have fun with friends. But I'm not in, interested in any politics or any positions. So I, please don't try to reach out to me <laughs> for any politics business because yeah. it's not what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It's not happening anymore. I'm okay. <laughs> there you have it. Can't, All right. can't say I blame you, but thank you for that what you have done and what you continue to do, Beatrice. So um uh, uh thanks again and have a good day. You too have a wonderful day, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy, but also to everyone who helps spread the word about the show. That can be by telling a friend, by writing a positive statement on Twitter or Facebook or whatever your preferred social media outlet is, by writing a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform. All of that stuff helps. But most of all, I want to thank the people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, the show would not be possible. So here we go. Thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities, Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Greg Nattel, I am Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jen Scream, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, the Mysterious Moon Master 9000, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant, Todd Kennedy, and I'd like to give thanks to Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Land, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri. Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zelecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Days Chess Academy, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Evan Sagers, I am Alec Donny Ariel. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geer Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Fidel, newly minted I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Namsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reifworth, Laura Beljavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Miguel Araspidi, Mr. Michael Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, 
Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tachi of Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you guys soon.